This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. This morning we have a special visitor today. Alex uh, Fenneroff is down here from uh, Duke to visit us today. Uh, Alex is uh, sort of Duke all the way through, undergraduate, and even like some basketball team up there that I think Doug likes too. And uh, uh, did his uh, medical school residency fellowship and is currently an interventional fellow up there. Uh, he's also has uh, one of the AHA, it's very prestigious fellow to faculty transition grants, supporting his work in health services research. He's published quite extensively already. Um, and last night we had a, a good discussion about CCU utilization, which is uh, sort of a big issue here as we as we struggle for beds. Um, so today he's going to give us sort of tell us a lot about uh, bridging the evidence gap in health services research. Alex, welcome. So thank you all for having me. It's a tremendous honor to be here. Uh, so you know, I thought I'd put this slide up. You know, to, to be at the place where uh, where interventional cardiology was uh, invented in the U.S. as a, as an interventional cardiology fellow. A tremendous honor. Very humbling. Uh, this is actually the last interventional cardiology type slide that I have. So if you're expecting discussion of balloons and catheters, I'm sorry. I guess you can leave. Um, <laughs> So this is this is the uh, the first time I was ever in Atlanta. It was uh, it was 2006. I was a, a junior at Duke. I was covering the basketball team for the newspaper, and I came uh, for the for the Sweet 16. And I thought the Elite Eight, uh, and, and Duke was number one at the time, and, and they lost to LSU, and it was it was very disappointing. So hopefully this visit uh, to Atlanta is better than the last time I was here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the evidence gap. Uh, first, I'll, I'll kind of define what it is and define where I'm coming from with it. And then I'll talk about a, a, an episode or a, 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 an example of a time that I th or of, of work that I'm doing where I think I'm, I'm trying to close the evidence gap. And, and to me, uh, that kind of we're going to look at IC utilization and NSTEMI. And to me, closing the evidence gap kind of comes in, in really four steps, which is describing a problem, forming a solution implementing the solution and measuring the results. So I'll talk about that in the context of ICU utilization for NSTEMI. And then I'll talk more broadly about how we can redesign clinical research to close the evidence gap and to, and to create more situations where we have evidence to take care of patients in the way that they should be taken care of. So I'm going to start with, I think, the motivating idea that, that all of, that, that I think about, and part of this is, is coming from Duke and being raised in the, in the church of Rob Califf. And that's that physicians' decisions should be guided by evidence uh, wherever possible and, and really all the time. And the problem with this is that evidence is sparse. And this is um, a really seminal paper uh, from 2009 looking at scientific evidence underlying the ACHA clinical practice guidelines. This is actually updated uh, yesterday or last week. Um, but at least as of 2009, 12% of recommendations in cardiovascular guidelines are level of evidence A, meaning they're supported by randomized controlled trial evidence. Um, so the, the problem is, is that you get guideline statements that look like this, and this is from the, uh, NS, the, non, the non ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome guidelines, um, which is that risk stratification models can be useful in end STEMI management. And this is a class 2A recommendation, level of evidence B. So like many of our guideline statements, I think this one raises more questions than it answers. Which uh, risk stratification model should we use? How should we use them? How should we implement them? And so this is a, a guideline statement like this is really what uh, motivates part of um, the NSTEMI IC utilization work that I've done. But the other part that motivated it is actually the way that uh, we practice medicine at Duke, or we used to practice medicine at Duke when I started my residency and my fellowship. And that's, so I would be the CCU fellow, and I would get a call from the ED, and they would say, I have a patient with a positive troponin downstairs. And that was what they would say, because they didn't, they didn't bother to think about, you know, they didn't want to tell me they had a patient with acute coronary syndrome, they just, they stuck with positive troponin. And that was because the policy when I started at Duke was that if you had an NSTEMI, you were admitted to the CCU. Regardless of, of how sick you were, you could have no chest pain, you could have a troponin that was 0.1, uh, you know, uh, microgram per deciliter above the uh, upper limit of normal, you were coming to the CCU. And at the same time, we had patients on dopamine and dobutamine drip sitting on the floor with heart failure. 
And as the CCU fellow, this was kind of infuriating because I was taking patients that weren't sick to the CCU, and it felt like a tremendous waste of resources. So this motiv motivated me to look at ICU utilization uh, more broadly in the, in the national landscape. And what we did was we used the Action Registry Get With the Guidelines, which is a national quality improvement registry that enrolls patients at about 600 hospitals nationwide, consecutive patients with MI. And we actually linked this to uh, Medicare claims data to get ICU utilization. And we measured the proportion of patients with initially stable NSTEMI that went to the ICU at all of these hospitals. And you know, initially stable we defined as absence of cardiac shock or uh, Cardi cardiogenic shock or cardiac arrest at the time they showed up to the hospital. So what you can see here is that there's essentially a bell-shaped distribution of the portion of patients with NSTEMI that went to the ICU, with some hospitals admitting no patients uh, with NSTEMI to the ICU and some admitting almost all of them. The median hospital admitted about 38%. So this sort of uh, variability on a nationwide level suggests that maybe there was uh, not a lot of rationality in the way ICUs were utilized nationwide. But of course, you know, hospitals could have different case mix, they could be different types of hospitals. So we wanted to look at this further. So we divided the hospitals into low, intermediate, and high ICU utilization hospitals, and we described hospital characteristics and patient characteristics of each of those hospitals. So when you look at hospital characteristics, we can only define this really broadly, but you know, this, the low, intermediate, and high ICU utilization hospitals, the same proportion had CT surgery available, the same proportion were academic hospitals, and the mean number of beds was pretty variable, but at least if you look at low and high ICU utilization hospitals, there wasn't a tremendous difference. Now, of course, case mix could be different at these hospitals, so we looked at that as well. And what you see is that patients at low, intermediate, and high ICU utilization hospitals were the same age, similar proportions had prior MI, prior heart failure, heart failure on presentation, their heart rate and systolic blood pressure on presentation were about the same. Initial creatinine, initial troponin as a ratio of the upper to normal, about the same. And their action risk score, which is kind of a, a similar to the GRACE risk score, combines all of these into, into one number, was the same in all of the hospitals. So, you know, from this, we can, we can say that case mix isn't different, hospitals aren't different, and they're using, uh, they're, they're, they're admitting different proportions of patients to the ICU. But of course, high, uh, low ICU utilization hospitals might just be admitting the highest risk patients. And maybe, maybe hospitals are just kind of rationally allocating their resources based on the number of CCU beds they have. So we looked at the action ICU risk score, so the, sorry, the action mortality risk score of patients that went to versus didn't go to the ICU at low, intermediate, and high ICU utilization hospitals. And you can focus on kind of this box and whisker plot over here. And what you see, these are box and whisker plots that show the action mortality risk scores, median and interquartile ranges for patients that didn't go to the ICU versus those that did go to the ICU. And this is for low ICU utilization hospitals. And what you see is that patients that didn't go to the ICU and did go to the ICU essentially have the same median action, IC, median action mortality risk score, same interquartile ranges. Now, our p-value is significant, but that's because we had you know, 8,000 patients. Um, and you can see the same pattern holds for intermediate and high ICU utilization hospitals. So what we gather from this is that even at low, intermediate, and high ICU utilization hospitals, uh, the, the types of patients that go to the ICU and don't go to the ICU are essentially the same. So from that, you know, kind of the nationwide picture for ICU utilization for hemodynamically stable patients with NSTEMI is that patient with NSTEMI <laughs> comes into the ED, and who knows what happens to them? You know, it depends on who's on, who's in the ED, who's, on, who's in the CCU, what the weather is, how many beds are in the CCU. So that's not really a rational way to allocate resources, I don't think. So here's what I would propose, a way to rationally allocate ICU resources for patients with NSTEMI, is that you have a patient with NSTEMI, you apply evidence to determine risk, like the guideline says, you take the high-risk patients and put them in the ICU, and you take the low-risk patients and you put them somewhere else. The problem with that is that existing risk scores are designed to predict mortality. So the GRACE risk score, the TIMI risk score, the action mortality risk score, they, they predict in-hospital mortality. They do a pretty good job of it. But need for ICU might not be captured by mortality alone. So patients can have cardiogenic shock, they can have cardiac arrest, they can have heart block, respiratory failure, and survive and not, and, you know, and not be captured in these risk scores. So what we did is we developed our own risk score to predict need for ICU. And we did it in the action registry, again linked to Medicare claims data. We excluded patients with cardiac arrest or cardiogenic shock on presentation because those are patients that need the ICU regardless of their NSTEMI. We excluded transfer in patients because those patients might have some data at their outside, during their outside hospital course that tells you where they ought to go. And we excluded patients with multiple admissions during the study period because of double counting issues. This was actually very few patients. So we had a population of initially stable NSTEMI patients that were older than 65 because of the Medicare claims data linkage. And we had about 30,000 patients. 
And we created a multivariable model that uses variables present on, uh, at the time of hospital presentation, so when somebody's making a decision, uh, to, uh, when a patient's in the ED, to send them to the ICU or the floor, to predict this composite outcome that we called need for ICU care. And that was patients that had in-hospital death, development of cardiac arrest, any type of shock, heart block requiring pacemaker, stroke or respiratory failure, and we, we specified that these uh, conditions were not to be associated with coronary, ar coronary artery bypass grafting, because we were trying to predict consequences of NSTEMI, not of, of cabbage, and patients with cabbage usually go to the ICU afterwards anyway at most institutions. So we took our multivariable model that we created and turned it into a bedside risk score by creating a, you know, creating a series of points. And this works kind of like the GRACE risk score. You add up the number of points and you get the, you get the total score. So patients get one point for age greater than or equal to 70, one point for a serum creatinine greater than or equal to one milligram per deciliter, three points for heart rate greater than 100, one point for 85 to 100, uh, three points for systolic blood pressure less than 125, one for 125 to 145, two points for initial troponin greater than or equal to upper limit, uh, greater than or equal to 12 times the upper limit of normal, uh, five points if they have heart failure on presentation, this was the strongest predictor and gets the most points, one point for ST segment depression, one point actually for the absence of prior vascularization, as it turns out prior vascularization was um, protective, and two points for chronic lung disease, again, because respiratory failure is one of the uh, outcomes in our multivariable model. So we, we tested the uh, discrimination of our model with the C statistic, and then again, by, and then internally validated with bootstrapping, and the C statistic was 0 0.73, so reasonable predictive ability. And then we tested the calibration just by plotting this graph. And what you can see is that patients with a score of less than or equal to one, so zero or one, had a risk of 3.4% of developing in-hospital complications requiring ICU utilization. And patients with a score of greater than or equal to 14 had almost a 40% chance of developing um, in-hospital complications requiring ICU care. And there's a, a graded uh, increase with um, increasing with increasing score. So a score of, of about five, th these patients have about a 10% chance of requiring ICU utilization. And about half of patients have a score less than or equal to five, and half of patients have a score of, uh, of uh, greater than five. So this was, this was really the work that led to the ACC, or sorry, the, uh, the AHA Fellow to Faculty grant. And in, in the future, we're gonna look at the association between ICU utilization, hospital level ICU utilization, and medication adherence and long-term outcomes, hypothesizing that maybe being in the ICU convinces patients that they're actually sick and they'll take their medications, or alternatively, um, an additional uh, transfer of care during a three-day hospital stay is, is bad for patients and uh, limits their understanding of their condition and, and the teaching they can get. We're gonna look at the association between ICU utilization and healthcare costs on the hospital level. And then we're gonna do a decision analysis modeling study of risk-based ICU admission using the action ICU score versus usual care, essentially random allocation of ICU resources. So I think that this is all kind of traditional health services research work. This is the type of thing we do. We create risk models, we send it out into, into some journals, we expect that people will use it, and uh, they don't. So risk scores are used infrequently in clinical practice. Um, if you look at, uh, there have been a couple of, risk, a couple of studies looking at the, the use of risk scores in, uh, in centers in Europe, and about 33 or so percent of uh, patients with NSTEMI have a risk score calculated in the ED, pretty low. And that's because, you know, the provider first needs to remember that the risk score exists. Then they either need to remember exactly how to calculate the risk score in their head, or they need to leave the EHR to use an online calculator. And, and so this is a problem because it means that we're not using evidence to take care of our patients. And my solution is that we should really bring the risk score to the provider. And the metaphor I like to think about is this. Taking care of patients, using the EHR, being a, a doctor a lot of times is like digging through a really dirty closet. All of the, all the stuff you need is in there, uh, but unless you use it a lot, you don't know where it is. So, you know, when we're taking care of patients with MI, we know exactly where the risk score calculator is in our brains, and we can reach into the closet and find that second red shoe to go with the outfit that we need, and, and it all works out. For an emergency department doctor, or a general practitioner, or, a, or a, um, you know, a family medicine doctor, whoever is taking care of these patients um, you know, outside of the cardiology setting, they might not even know that that red shoe is in the closet. So instead, you want to make things easy for people. And you know, this is how George Jetson got dressed in the morning, and this seems a lot easier, or actually this is how he got dressed when he got home from work. But this, this seems a lot easier than digging through a closet. You know, you give people the information they need at the time that they need it, and you know, get them headed in the right direction. So what we did is we decided to build our action ICU risk score 
into our EHR at Duke. And this, this was the implementation phase of what we did. And the first thing that we had to do, which I think was a really big learning experience for me, was we had, I had to get everybody that was involved in the care of patients with NSTEMI at a, at a large hospital with more opinions than people on board uh, on how we were going to do this. And so the first step was what was actually, what, what uh, threshold risk score were we actually going to choose? And that, this was a series of discussions amongst the ED and the general cardiology and, and the ICU, but ultimately it settled um, on a score of five. So patients with a score of five or less, we're going to go to the floor. Patients with a score of, of greater than, or, or six or greater, we're going to go to the CCU. And if you remember, before we did this, we were sending all of our patients with NSTEMI to the ICU. So we were going to decrease ICU utilization by about half by doing this. So this was, this was an accomplishment and uh, you know, going to be an accomplishment. We'll see. I'll, I'll show you the data for whether it was. Um, so what we did is, is we worked with um, the IT folks at, at Duke and, and the Epic EHR uh, to build a, essentially a decision aid um, that shows up in the EHR for these patients. And it's a modified best practice advisory. So it triggers automatically in the ED on, a po on patients with positive troponin. And it says this patient might have NSTEMI based on the positive troponin. And it tells, patient, it tells the ED providers to click on this hyperlink to go to the risk score calculator. They can click dismiss to get rid of it temporarily if they actually want to, you know, if they, if they haven't seen the patient yet and they want to they go uh, interview them and talk to them. And then there's a drop down menu that lets them cancel the calculator forever. So they can, and the reasons they might want to cancel it are if the patient has a STEMI and that's why they have a positive troponin because that's not an appropriate use of the risk score calculator. If they don't have an N STEMI, you know, or if they don't have a, what we call it, you know, they don't have, they have a type 1 MI. Um, so maybe they, maybe they're coming in, maybe they have renal failure, maybe they're coming in with shock, septic shock, and they have, and they have a positive troponin. So that's not an appropriate patient to calculate the risk score. And then if they have shock or cardiac arrest and need the ICU anyway, we didn't want them to calculate the risk score. So they can, they can use this drop down menu, get rid of the risk score calculator forever if it's not appropriate to calculate. So after talking with the ED doctors, we decided to build this so it sits on the side of the screen to allow for simultaneous chart access. And this is what it looks like uh, for the ED providers. There are five fields that auto-populate, age, heart rate, blood pressure, creatinine, and troponin, and then four yes or no boxes that the ED doctors click uh, to answer questions. And one of those is heart failure on first medical contact, um, because that's something you can't get from a from chart review. And the other ones were ST depression, prior vascularization, and chronic lung disease, because it was a little bit hard to capture those. Um, with, the, with the vagaries of the EHR system. So it gives them an output of, of high or low risk, plus um, the rationale for that tells them where they get the points for, so it's not just a black box, um, plus a recommendation for management. So you see down here it says uh, zero to five is low risk for clinical deterioration, and they should consider treatment in a step-down bed if it's congruent, congruent with their clinical assessment. And it gives them some reasons that the patient might need treatment in the ICU, if they have chest pain, if they have vital side abnormalities, if they're having uh, electrical instability, things like that. And I think that one of the important things that, that we did is we weren't trying to prescribe care to ED doctors, um, but we were trying to guide them in, in the right direction. Um, so I'll talk a little, we have, we have data for the first six months of, of the rollout here, so I'll talk a little bit about that. We're gonna have data through 12 months pretty soon. Um, so this is, this is very preliminary, but you know, when, when you're evaluating an implementation, you wanna look at uh, both you know, fidelity to the intervention, did the people you were trying to change their behavior, did you actually change their behavior, did they use your intervention? And then second, how did it, so we look at ICU utilization, so how did it affect uh, the way we took care of patients at Duke Hospital? So the first thing is that this triggered on 462 patients over six months, which seems like a lot, except, you know, when you divide that by 26, uh, 26 weeks, it triggered about 17 times per week. And when you divide that over all the ED providers that are seeing patients the ED, that's actually not, that's not a lot of times per provider. Um, but 54% of the time it was hidden until the patient, the, the risk calculator was hidden until the patient left the ED. So they just clicked dismiss until the patient left the ED. They didn't calculate a score. Not what they were supposed to be doing. 25% of the time they canceled it, presumably because it was inappropriate. 18% of the time they actually calculated a score. 4% of the time they went into the score calculator and didn't actually click calculate. When we look at patients with, a, with, a, with one of their final hospital diagnoses being NSTEMI, we did a little bit better. It triggered on 78 patients over that time. So again, dividing that by six months, that's about 12 patients per month. So you know, as cardiologists, we think that NSTEMIs are very common. We see them all the time. But as, as ED providers looking at patients that come through the ED, much less common and I think highlights the need for, for giving them the tools to take care of these patients in an evidence-based way. Anyway, amongst these patients, 44% of the time it was hidden, 
13% of the time cancel is inappropriate. Presumably those are patients uh, that were initially unstable and needed the ICU. And 41% of the time the score was calculated. So next we looked at the proportion of patients admitted to the ICU uh, before and after rollout of our risk calculator. And you, know, you can see before is in, is in blue. This is the monthly proportion of patients that went directly from the ED to the ICU. After is in red. And I told you when we started that we were admitting every patient with NSTEMI to the ICU at Duke. As it turns out, right about here, uh, right about you know, a few months before we, before, a few months before this rolled out, we actually published our paper showing national trends in ICU utilization for NSTEMI. And it was pretty clear that Duke was an outlier. So our practice changed uh, before we rolled out the risk calculator, which was a bummer for my study, but probably overall good for the institution and for the patients. Um, but you can see that the proportion of patients that went directly from the ED to the ICU was somewhere between 30 and 50 percent before the rollout, somewhere between 30 and 50 percent after. So it didn't really make much of a difference in the proportion of patients that went to the ICU. As a safety measure, we wanted to look at the proportion of patients that were transferred to the ICU. So patients initially admitted elsewhere, then transferred to the ICU. Before the rollout, about 10 percent. After the rollout, also about 10 percent. Didn't seem to change all that much. At least we weren't hurting people by sending them to the wrong place. Now, this, this looks at the action ICU scores for patients that went to the ICU uh, in blue versus went to the floor in red before implementation here on the left and after implementation on the right. So what you can see is that before implementation, the median action ICU risk score for patients that went to the floor uh, was five versus seven for patients that went to the ICU, but the interquartile ranges are broad and overlap substantially. After implementation, the median action, the median action ICU score risk scores for these patients didn't change much, but you can see that the uh, interquartile ranges have narrowed substantially. So perhaps, and this is preliminary, perhaps we're admitting a more homogeneously high risk group of patients to the ICU and a more homogeneously low risk patient, group, of, group of patients to the floor. Um, but I think that that kind of remains to be seen with when we get more data. So I talked a little bit about this, but challenges in this sort of design is that we have a before-after study design, and secular changes in ICU utilization, as I talked about, make interpretation of, of this challenging. The second is that we have a single center study. So the question is, would this work at other centers with different ICU utilization patterns, different ED practices, things like that? So the holy grail for something like this, and what's ideally next, is to do a cluster randomized trial of risk-based ICU admission for NSTEMI versus usual care. And every time I say that to people, they say, well, you're not going to do that. No one's going to pay for that. And I think that's true. In the clinical trial system we have now, in the clinical trial, it's true, I should say, it's in the clinical trial system we have now, that is true. No one is going to pay $300 million or even $30 million to do this trial. So, you know, that's a problem. But for me, instead of hearing nobody's going to pay for that, I come back to what I think is my core belief, which is that physician's decision should be guided by evidence. So instead of saying no one's going to pay for that, we should say, well, how do we do this in a world where no one's going to pay for it? And I'll, I'll pause here and I'll say, what kind of evidence should physician's decisions be guided by? Because you know, obviously, we have some evidence to, to, guide, our, to guide the use of, uh, of risk-based ICU utilization. It's not randomized evidence, but it's good evidence. So this is, this is data from two groups that looked at the hospital readmissions reduction program. Uh, over here, one group. Over here, the other group. So this is the first paper that came out on this topic. It was published in JAMA. And they're, they're looking at um, temporal trends in readmissions here in the black and temporal trends in mortality here in the, in the orange. And here is when the hospital readmissions reduction program went into effect. And what they concluded in, in this paper in JAMA is that the hospital readmissions reduction program reduced uh, readmission and had an increased mortality. So another group working in JAMA cardiology did essentially the same thing. They looked at temporal changes in uh, readmissions and mortality uh, before and after the readmissions reduction program. And they found that, they, that this program reduced readmissions and had no change on mortality. So what you have here are two groups looking at essentially the same data to answer the same question, coming up with totally opposite results. And I do a lot of observational research. I like observational research. But when you can do the same, when you, when you can look at the same data and come up with two different answers, I think that's probably a problem when you're trying to use observational research for, for comparative effectiveness. So ideally, you have randomized data to guide decisions that you're making that help you take care of patients, uh, both on an individual patient level and a policy level. And I'll talk more about the individual, individual patient level. 
So despite a lot of effort, we're still not doing enough randomized clinical trials. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, but every patient interaction with the healthcare system should help us better take care of the next patient. We should, have, we should get actionable data to take care of the next patient from the patient that we just saw. And to develop knowledge that drives change, I would say that observational data is probably not enough. And in most cases, or nearly all cases, randomization is necessary. So this is kind of the, the, the world that, that we used to live in maybe about 10 years ago, and that's that clinical care and clinical trials were totally separate. We took care of patients on the clinical side. We enrolled a highly select group of patients into clinical trials, and we used clinical trials to, in many cases, to guide our clinical care. But you know, there was a lot of understanding that these patients didn't necessarily overlap, and there were issues with doing that. Over the past 10 years, we've kind of developed this concept of the, of the pragmatic clinical trial, where clinical trials are closer to clinical care, and we, may we might take some of the data generated for clinical care and use them in the context of clinical trials. Um, but really, this is, this is essentially a parallel track, and, and it's, only, it's only some of our patients that get enrolled in these pragmatic clinical trials, hopefully an increasing number, maybe not. Um, but these are, these are still kind of, it, it's, it's a new space that exists in the middle, but the tracks are still largely separate. What we really need is to merge clinical care with continuous evidence generation from randomized clinical trials so that we can learn from every patient that we take care of. And when we do that, we'll have something that looks like a national learning healthcare system where every patient gives us new information to help us take care of the next patient and we, continue, we can continually improve. And you know, that's what, uh, you know, that, that's what Google does. You know, they randomize you to the A search or the B search and they continually improve their algorithm. And, and we don't do this in healthcare. In healthcare, we do experiments and then we try and, you know, we, we do very selected experiments and then we try and backtrack that onto our patients instead of continually improving and getting better. And, and I would say that we, we owe it to our patients to continually improve and make our system better. So how do we get there? It's a lot for me to stand up here as an interventional cardiology fellow or a cardiology fellow at all and say that we need to go to a learning, a national learning healthcare system. But I think that there are things that, that you know, individuals can do and that people like me can do to help us get there. And, and these kind of fall into four categories. The first is to demonstrate the need uh, for, for doing, uh, for a continuous evidence generation through randomized clinical trials. The second is to do pragmatic or large simple trials, which leads into the third, which is to develop these methods uh, for embedding clinical research or embedding randomized controlled trials into clinical care. And lastly, we can identify areas where incentives align to conduct clinical trials within or across health systems uh, to, 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 you know, to, to build randomized clinical trials into, into, the care that we, in, into the care we're delivering. So first is demonstrating the need. So I showed the slide earlier with showing that evidence is sparse. So as of 2009, 12% of recommendations in cardiovascular guidelines level of evidence A. We replicated this recently. And this, is, uh, this will be published in a, a general interest medical journal in about a month. Uh, so I can't tell you which one because they get mad at you. Um, but so what we did is, is we looked at the proportion of recommendations um, supported by, or that were characterized as level of evidence A, uh, overall, and then across subject areas in the ACCHA and ESC guidelines. And what you can see here is that overall in the ACCHA guidelines, about 9%, of, 8 to 9% of recommendations are supported by level of evidence A uh, evidence. The ESC guidelines do a little bit better. They're about 14% of, of, of recommendations. But it has to do, I think, with the way that, that the two guideline committees uh, make their recommendations. But when you look at this by subject area, general cardiology does pretty well, about 10% of recommendations or so. Coronary artery disease pretty well. But something like congenital and valvular heart disease, you know, 2 and 1% of recommendations in the ACHA and uh, ESC guidelines are supported by evidence from randomized controlled trials. And for me, this, this speaks to the difficulty of enrolling uh, some highly selected patients into clinical trials. We, we can't capture them. And we're talking a lot about personalized medicine and enrolling patients into clinical trials, or taking care of patients based on their phenotypes. Um, but if we can't enroll patients with mitral regurgitation into clinical trials, how are we going to identify patients with very specific uh, genotypes uh, in, in, into clinical trials? And instead, I, you know, it makes me worry that when we talk about personalized medicine, we're going to talk about subset analyses, which uh, make me, makes me nervous. So to, to, we looked a little bit more closely at, uh, at ACC, AHA guidelines, and ESC guidelines, the prior and current versions of guidelines for, for guideline documents that um, have been updated um, 
in the past uh, 10 years or so, or sorry, in the past 20 years or so. So each of these dots represents a different guideline recommendation or a, diff a different class of guidelines. So I think the, you know, one of these dots might represent uh, non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome guidelines or stable ischemic heart disease guidelines. And so we looked at the proportion of level, of level of evidence A recommendations in the current version of the guidelines over here in the prior version. And, and what you can see is there's not some global trend um, towards increased proportion of recommendations, level of evidence A, and very similar in the ESC guidelines. And even when we looked at the number of recommendations that were supported by level of evidence A, uh, evidence, there was really no change from prior to current guideline recommendations. So despite a lot of people working really hard to build pragmatic clinical trials, do more clinical trials, we're not, we're not at least, we're not at least building the evidence base um, in a way that makes, in a way that, that moves the needle. So why aren't we uh, moving the evidence base with clinical trials? And one reason is that we have decreasing patient participation in clinical trials. This is an analysis of the, of the action registry that we did. Um, this uh, manuscript is in submission. Um, and this, this looks at the proportion of patients at action registry hospitals that were enrolled in a clinical trial during their initial hospitalization. And what you can see is that in 2008, 2.5% of patients with NSTEM were enrolled in the clinical trial. By 2014, it was less than 1%. So less than 1% of patients with MI were enrolled in the clinical trial during their hospital stay. And this looks at the proportion of action registry sites that enrolled at least one patient in a clinical trial, at least one MI patient in a clinical trial over time. So in 2009, about 37% of hospitals enrolled at least one patient with MI in a clinical trial. By 2014, it was down to less than 27%. So patients aren't participating in clinical trials. Hospitals aren't participating in clinical trials. To me, that suggests that we need to think about how we're doing clinical trials to make them more attractive to patients and hospitals. So why does good evidence matter? This gets to another, you know, demonstrating the need. So good evidence is the first step in delivering uniform, high-quality, evidence-based care. And I think that that's somewhat obvious, but one way to illustrate that is, is to look at this guideline recommendation, which is from the Stable Ischemic Heart Disease Guidelines. It's a class one level evidence B recommendation that calcium channel blockers or long-acting nitrates, in addition to beta blockers, should be prescribed for relief of symptoms in patients that have angina um, despite beta blocker treatment. So we looked at this in the Translate Registry, which was a registry of patients with um, MI that were uh, treated with PCI in the US, and it was conducted several years ago. But what we looked at, we actually identified the patients that self-reported angina um, in, in the Translate Registry, and we looked at the proportion of patients that were treated with non-beta blocker anti-anginal medications. And these colors are a little bit busy because they, they, they show all of the different combinations of anti-anginal medications, but the bottom line is that at six weeks after MI, patients that self-reported angina uh, less than 20% of them were being treated with a non-beta blocker anti angina medication despite a class one guideline recommendation to do so. And by 12 months, uh, still, of patients reporting angina, less than 25% uh, treated with a non-beta blocker anti angina medication. So in the absence of good data, uh, you have the absence of good treatment. So the second way to get to a uh, national learning healthcare system is to do pragmatic or large simple trials. So I actually, as a fellow at the DCRI, was able to participate in the Artemis uh, uh, cluster randomized trial, which took patients with MI, uh, uh, treated at 301 hospitals in the US, and randomized hospitals to either um, a copayment intervention where the patients, the patients got vouchers to take care of the copays on their P2I12 inhibitor, or to usual care. And doing trials like this, you learn a lot about how to do, uh, how, what, what it's like to do pragmatic uh, trials and what some of the pitfalls are. So the hospitals that were in the copayment intervention group knew they were in the copayment intervention group and they enrolled a, a cohort of patients that was poorer, older, sicker, patients that they thought would benefit from copayment intervention for not having to pay their copayment for the P2I12 inhibitor. Hospitals in the usual care arm enrolled the types of patients we enroll in clinical trials healthier, richer, whiter. So, and, and then when you go back to try and compare these groups, you see that that's, it's a challenge. So how do we design you know, the pragmatic clinical trials of the future? How do we design the learning health system trials of the future to get around this? And I think that that remains an open question. So the second thing we can do is to develop methods. So Artemis measured uh, non-persistence in two ways. Patients were asked at three, six, nine, and 12 months whether they were taking their medication. And what you can see here in red is that only about 5% of patients 
at three months reported not taking their medicine, and that increased to 14% by 12 months. But when you actually looked at pharmacy fill data, so you got the data from the pharmacy and you saw whether patients were filling their medications, 28% were non-persistent by three months, 48% by 12 months. So this huge gap in non-persistence just based on how you measure non-persistence. And so as we're doing these, these clinical trials of the future, maybe one of our endpoints is going to be persistence. How do you measure that? Where does the truth lie? You know, so part of, part of the important thing is, is to develop these methods and develop an understanding of, of what it means to do these trials. The other thing, the, the other type of methods we have to develop are, are methods for, for getting informed consent. So one of the barriers to enrolling patients in clinical trials is you need a small army of people to enroll them. And so this is work done by, by Dr. Dickert here that they asked patients, so you focus on over here, so they, they asked patients whether they would uh, be okay with verbal consent in a, in a randomized controlled trial, and 60% of patients said they would probably or definitely be okay with it. So maybe that's, you know, one solution to, you know, thinking about different ways of consenting patients. Maybe one of the solutions to enrolling more patients in clinical trials, enrolling more patients in, in pragmatic clinical trials. And we actually looked at a different way of informed consent in a registry we did at Duke, which, which was the Palm Registry. So this enrolled patients um, in uh, primary care and cardiology clinics, uh, basically for a survey and a, and a, and a blood lipid panel. Um, but instead of, instead of doing a kind of traditional face-to-face uh, -face informed consent with a long text page, uh, we developed this video informed consent process. And it was this gamified pathway that patients treated down looking at videos the whole time. Um, they could repeat videos, they could flag for questions, and they got this medal when they finished it, so it, you know, it, it made them happy. Um, and, you know, instead of kind of the traditional reading a long, a long page, we had people from the study team talking to the patients about what being in the study meant. We had videos showing what it, would, what it would be like to be in the study. And ultimately, about half of study sites approved video informed consent. The other half had some issues with the IRB, the any specific language, we couldn't do it. So what we had was essentially a natural experiment where we could look at the types of patients that were enrolled at video informed consent sites and the types of patients that didn't. So at video informed consent sites, they enrolled a larger proportion of African American patients, older patients, and patients without college degrees. So diff thinking of different ways to do informed consent might help, in might help capture kind of a more real world cohort of patients. The other thing is that coordinators at the sites that had video informed consent told us that they felt like they could enroll patients easier. Um, they could hand patients the iPad, they could enroll multiple patients at once. So maybe another, another way to um, to better enroll patients in clinical trials, reduce the burden on hospitals and healthcare systems in enrolling patients in clinical trials. Um, so the last thing we can do uh, to get to a national learning healthcare system is to identify areas where incentives align to conduct these sorts of clinical trials. So alternative payment models are growing as a proportion of Medicare expenditures. So 2016, it was 30%, by 2018, 50%. So these types of capitated models are going to uh, reward systems that think differently or think about how they're taking care of patients and um, learn to take care of patients in, in evidence-based ways. And I think here, you know, Emory is a large healthcare system. There's, there's the possibility to conduct, to potentially conduct clinical trials uh, where, you're cluster, where you're randomizing hospitals, randomizing units, or things of that nature. So a tremendous opportunity, I would say. So that's, that's all I have. I thank you guys for talking. These are my two kids, uh, Evie and, and Ruthie. Um, they don't know what I do. They don't really care. Um, so thank you, guys. Thanks, Alex. That's great. So, so I'll start off with some questions. So you know, a lot of this data come from registries. And, and I must admit, we're getting a little registry fatigue. And I wonder if you would talk about that a little bit, because every time I turn around, Avi sends me an email about a new registry for this or for that. And uh, you, know, you know, there's a lot of not only cost up front, but just sort of all the personnel to collect data. And we try to be as automated as possible. But, but again, at some point, it, it becomes a little overwhelming for a medical center. Yeah, so I've, I've, you know, I've had the chance at the DCRI uh, to work on the data analytic teams for um, the action registry and the CAF PCI registry. And, and I, I agree. I mean, you know, we're, we're collecting a tremendous amount of data, double collecting a tremendous amount of data on so many patients with so many different, with so many different clinical conditions. And the, the data collection forms can be long. Uh, 
they can be, you know, they, they, I think the CAT PCI one is five or six pages now. I mean, that's, and, and it, it's, it's double collected. So I think, you know, and, and part of it is that I think that the way that we're using these registries is not necessarily uh, in a way that affects patient care. So how many times can you, can you write observational papers about a new variable in the CAF PCI or the action registry? I mean, I, I'm guilty. I've done that. Um, so, but, but at the same time, you know, can, can we, if, if I think we were using our registries in a way that we really felt was affecting patient care, and, you know, we, we were using our registries maybe as the baseline for clinical trial, for ongoing clinical trial, or as the baseline data collection for, for ongoing clinical trials, maybe we would feel differently about the value of collecting that data. And I think that, that that's, I think that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, is that, is that collecting registry data to collect registry data, uh, to me, doesn't move the needle as much as collecting registry data in a way that helps us to improve the care of our patients and really thinking selectively about what data we're collecting, why we're collecting it, how are we going to use it to make our patients better. Alex, thanks for, for, for coming down. This was a, a terrific talk and progression of, of, of how you've thought about this whole process. Um, uh, it was the same seven, 17 years ago where we admitted patients at Duke for a positive troponin, and I'm glad to see you finally changed that practice, so congratulations to you. Um, the, the potentially, uh, two comments, I guess the potentially biggest drawback that I see in the approach of using a troponin level-based system to, to and then from a troponin level determining risk to determine if they go to a unit or not, is you're putting a whole lot of trust in a single lab value mm -hmm. as opposed to a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So I think we're now appreciating over time, particularly with the fourth universal definition of MI, that most of these patients with positive troponins are not having a type 1 end STEMI. You've already ruled out the STEMIs based on your ECG. Most of them are not having a type 1 end STEMI. They're having a type 2 MI or a non-MI troponin elevation, or what might be called myocardial injury without infarction. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is that's such a heterogeneous group that you're applying a risk score or you're applying risk algorithms to determine lower or high risk with such a heterogeneous group of diagnoses that you know, if I were to argue about designing something and doing it starting today, it probably would need to be more less based on a single lab value and more diagnosis-based where you consider the associated ischemic symptoms or other objective findings of ischemia. Yeah. So that's the first comment. Maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, so, so I guess the, the first thing I'll say is that we, so we did base it on, a, on an initial troponin value. We've actually changed it now. So it actually, we have high sensitivity troponin at Duke. So we've changed it so that it now triggers on a <laughs> delta troponin. I think that a lot of your comments um, a lot of your comments, you know, remain. I, I think that that's that's still it's it's a challenge. So when you're thinking about uh, building decision uh, dec decision aids into the EHR, part of the challenge is phenotyping patients, right? So how do you identify the patient with the phenotype electronically that you want to capture and you want to apply your risk decision aid to? And I think that, that it, you know, part of part of you know you're, you're going to identify the wrong patient sometimes. You're going to, you can either cast your net broadly or you can cast your net narrowly. So we, we could have built it in such a way that patients had to have a chief complaint of chest pain plus positive troponin. But my concern was that we would then miss a lot of patients. So part of what we did was we tried to trust the ED doctors, which again, you know, they're, they're physicians, you can, you know. We, we tried to trust the ED doctors to, um, to be able to separate out non-troponin, uh, sorry, non-MI troponin elevation from an MI. So I think that, that you know, ideally we would have had a, a better uh, electronic phenotype for MI, but work, you know, when, when you're working in kind of a, a, a time-limited space, you want to give them the data as soon as possible so they can get the patient out of the ED, um, you know, you can, you can only do so much. But I think that's a good, it's a good comment. The, the second comment is I, you know, you're, you're coming from the, House of Rob Califf, I, I, uh, the Church of Rob Califf, I fully appreciate initially the thought that um, you need RCTs as the highest level of evidence. And I thought that up until recently, and then about five years ago, I began to have a shift mm 
in terms of it, it just takes so long to generate data from RCTs and the questions you're choosing are so minute and specific that by the time you get an answer and then translate it, it's like six, seven, eight years out from the time you asked the question. Mm -hmm. So another approach would be the process improvement approach, which is to pick a standard that you think is pretty good and then implement that standard broadly and then iteratively, Im iteratively improve on that standard. Mm -hmm. And what is the impact on outcomes? And so there, there is evidence suggesting that that approach may yield uh, improved outcomes faster perhaps than asking one question at a time mm -hmm. for RCTs. And an, an example uh, comes from Intermountain Healthcare where they wanted to uh, participate in one of the NIH trials regarding uh, randomization to ventilator strategies for ARDS. And as part of, um, as part of the process to become a trial site, Intermountain first had to adopt the standard that was used by the control arm. And when they did that, they realized that all of their different sites across Intermountain uh, in Utah were using totally different standards. So the first thing they had to do was to get everyone to use one standard, agree on a standard, even if they didn't know what was the best thing, agree on that standard, and then say, okay, now we're ready to actually participate in the trial. And what they found is that when they got everyone to agree to use a single standard, they actually cut their mortality from ARDS in half, just by picking a standard and sticking to that standard. Mm -hmm. So examples like that get me thinking that, yes, we know RCTs are very important, they're going to be done, but as you've pointed out, enrollment's dropping, the, the trials are becoming more complicated and complex, the, the questions being asked are, be, are becoming more and more minute. Instead of, if you really want a learning health system, for the questions you identify, pick a standard that's pretty good. Don't worry if it's level of, if it's class one level of evidence A, or if it's class two A recommendation. Pick a standard that you think is pretty good and then iteratively improve upon that. And mm -hmm. Our experience here, at least, is it's, it's, it's pretty tough to even get people to agree upon and stick to a standard mm -hmm. across the whole hospital site. So yeah. anyway, that's my second comment. Thanks. Yeah. I, think, I, think what I, I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. What I would what I would say is that there there is potentially and, and you know this you know this area better than I do and I you know I, I hate the that, that's a, it's hard it's hard to come in here and tell you how to have to tell how to do their jobs or tell people you know my thoughts about what they do are um, but I think that that you do it's possible and when I when I say randomized control trials I'm not talking about the pie in the sky randomized control trial that we do I'm saying you know pick a standard and stick to it but then take hospital A and have them switch standards. On, on, have them switch to, switch to a new standard on such and such a date. Take hospital B and have them switch to a new standard on, the, you know, so, so you can do stepped wedge designs, cluster randomized designs, things like that. I, you know, I think that I'm not talking about doing kind of traditional randomized trials. I think that, that those types of designs, you know, as, as an adjunct to the process improvement types of things that, that you're talking about. Um, yeah, I think I think the, the last interchange is, is helpful because I think you know one of the, the the interesting trends as we look at sort of more system level kind of treatment allocation and using registries as a backbone for collecting data is is that the differences between you know more rigorous trial design and the kind of implement and, and see what happens starts to look a lot alike, right? And we and, and we can we can learn a lot from those things. One one thing I think is. Um, I was going to ask is, you know, with regard to kind of support for some of these things, you know, the obvious, the obvious people with skin in the game are various payers, right? So that's not been a platform that's really been effectively harnessed. Um, but if you have, the, if you have the, the kind of data collection platforms in place, are there ways to think about using, you know, kind of garnering support from various payers? Uh, to try to do this. Obviously, there's lots of examples where people are working at cross purposes. I think the most recent one is the ICD shared decision making where CMS implements a requirement that you have to do it literally the month that the first ever randomized 
trial of the decision aid for ICDs was funded by NHLBI, and AHRQ is issuing a call for figuring out how to measure shared decision making. So you have three federal agencies working at complete cross purposes. Um, so, so obviously there's a coordination problem um, that can often happen. Um, but I'm but I'm curious about your thoughts on whether there's kind of appetite for, um, you know, on the payer side, ways to kind of harness them as a potential mechanism to support some of these things that actually does help their bottom line. Right. I, mean, I think I think that's a really good question, and I, you know, to be honest, have not have not looked into have have not really had the chance to look into that myself. But I think that you're right that that's that's an obvious uh, an obvious group of people that that you can think about funding these trials. The challenge is that is that you know um, people switch health insurances. You know, the, the system that we have does not really uh, does not really lend itself to that. But I think that there are, there are systems, and there are, you know as we move towards a more calculated model, there will be you know there there will be different incentives to, to do things like that. And I think that you know whether it's payers or whether it's systems or whoever it is, I think we'll be the ones that pay for these. Great conversation and uh, great talk. Um, congratulations on all your work. So, I mean, I think just kind of continuing this conversation about registries versus clinical trials is mm -hmm. really germane to health services research. And um, I want to kind of dig in with you a little more about that because I, I sort of agree with you that it, it's not mutually exclusive to run registries, but make the registries not overburdened, overwhelming, but then conduct clinical trials within the registries. And if we think about what prevents us from running clinical trials within <coughs> registries, um, I guess it's, it's just the cost and the consent process and then the designing of the study. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the consent process is a really, really important part of that, right? Because once you're consenting a patient and you're saying, okay, we don't know there's equipoise here, we've got two different strategies, then you, you're going to have to, A, pay for the study uh, because it's not considered clinical trial, uh, it's not clinical care. Um, and the Europeans have done this quite well, right? Mm -hmm. As you know, they do have, uh, for instance, in, uh, in Denmark, they have these registries that are national registries where data are collected and then within them they run clinical trials like mm -hmm. the Sweetheart study, mm -hmm. for instance know, which was a FFR versus IFR-based study. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's potential for us, and if you tie that into leveraging third-party payer uh, to help support some of the costs, I think it's, it's pretty enticing to head in that direction. Yeah, I mean, you know, the U.S. has a 30, the, the population of the U.S. is 30 times the population of Sweden, um, you know, more diverse. I mean, if we could, if we could do in, in the U.S. What, what they've done in Sweden, I mean, we'd have a lot of answers to a lot of really important questions. I mean, and one of, you know, so one of the things, so we actually had a, a registry-based randomized trial in the U.S. Uh, that Sunil Rao ran uh, out of the DCRI, the, the, the Safe PCI study, Safe PCI for Women. Um, and, you know, so I was talking to Sunil, like, why, don't, why don't we do it again? And he was saying, well, you know, we do it once and it works out fine. You do it a second time, everyone wants a cut of, uh, of you know, of, of, of uh, you know, they, they want money to because you're using the registry. So I think that, that you know, you, it becomes it becomes a challenge to, to do things like that, but I think that it's it's the model, you know, that's one of the models I think that that will work in the future, and it's just a, a question of making it work. Okay. Well, with that, we'll thank you very much for a great talk, and uh, thanks for coming down. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.